dedicated to Saint Bartholomew, who was martyred in Armenia when he was skinned alive. And you will see a lot of effigies to Saint Bartholomew. So he uttered a few effigies as they were taking his skin off. I'm so rude. Hi everyone, Sinead with Free Tours by Foot London. Oh, look, there's a creepy guy there behind me, ladies and gents. Who is that? <laughs> oh my God, this is going to be a good one, ladies and gents. It's Halloween. It's time to get started. The spooky content is coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, let good me evening. introduce you to my best friend in the world. Hello. A fellow tour guide, a ghost tour guide. We are starting around Farringdon Station, one of the most haunted stations in London. In fact, the first railway network in London Coming the Metropolitan Line from Paddington to Farringdon Station. This was opened in 1863. But what Farringdon is most famous for is its screening spectre. And I want to take you back to the very dark history of the brutally murdered young girl called Anne Naylor. At 13 years of age, she had spent most of her life as an orphan working in a workhouse with her sister. And as was commonplace, these young girls were regularly sent to work as apprentices in local businesses, whether it be factories or haberdasheries. But unfortunately for Annie, she met the brutal duo of mother and daughter, Sarah and Sally Metyard. The sadistic duo were quick to anger and were sadistic in their punishments of these young apprentice girls. They regularly starved them, beat them, and subjected them to hours and end of torture. Anne, who wasn't quite healthy enough to keep up with the demands of the work, got the brunt of the abuse. And one morning, fearing for her life, she attempted an escape. Regretfully, she was caught by the young Sarah Metchard, who brought her back and viciously beat her with a broomstick on the bed. Not content with the sadistic punishment, her mother Sally entered the room and decided she would tie her to the door for three days using ropes. After three days, her lifeless body, terrified, the younger apprentices. When the Metyards finally realized that they had brutally murdered her, they attempted to conceal their crime by sending food up to Annie's room in an attempt to deceive the young apprentices. They even left the doors of the attic open and had said for a period of time that Annie had escaped. Brutally, they stuffed her body in a chest and left it there for two months. But of course, the smell of rotting flesh became all too apparent in the milliner's shop. So they attempted a dissection of Annie's body and attempted to burn parts of her flesh. The smell of the putrid burning flesh became so overpowering and obvious that they knew they had to get rid of Annie's remains. They dissected her corpse and they took her down here to a place called Chick Lane, where now Farrington Station is located and attempted to throw her dissected corpse over the wall. Quite terrifyingly, the following day when her body's remains were found, a coroner had disregarded it as remains that had been used for anatomical research by the surgeons in the area. Was she ever going to lay a rest? Would she ever seek her revenge? That came four years later. Over to you, Rob. So for the next four years after Annie's murder, this particular spot of London, which is now Farringdon Underground Station, was haunted by the scream of a girl. Now this scream was heard so often that people in the local area just assumed the area was haunted. They just wrote it off, wrote it off as a ghost. Now, four years later in 1762, a young man living in the area had just had his girlfriend move in with him after his girlfriend had had a particularly rough fight with her mum. His girlfriend's name was Sally Metyard. Now he just off the cuff one day mentioned to this girl, oh, by the way, now you're living in this area, just to let you know, there's a ghost of a scream of a little girl in this particular area over here. Sally Metyard broke down in tears and she admitted to her boyfriend, well, that's where me and my mum dumped the remains of a little girl four years ago that we killed. Now, the boyfriend was horrified, so he decided to go to the authorities. But of course, he didn't want to get his girlfriend in trouble. So he went to the authorities, told them it was her mum, Sarah Metyard, who'd done the whole crime by herself, not believing his girlfriend would be punished as well. Well, sadly for him, his plan didn't work. Both of the Met Yard women were arrested. They were tried, found guilty, and hanged. Now, during the executions, the older Sarah Met Yard, the mother, 
she passed out in shock. She couldn't believe she was going to be executed. She fainted on the journey to the gallows. Once they got to the gallows, they tried to revive her using smelling salts. But to no avail. To no avail. So what they, they did executed is her. they executed her limp, unconscious body. As for her daughter, Sally Matyard, well, she went to the gallows screaming in floods of tears, begging them not to take her life. Which, of course, is exactly what young Annie Naylor had probably done four years earlier. To this day, ladies and gentlemen, that screaming spectre can be heard all over Farringdon Station, particularly late at night. The terrifying, haunting screams of a girl who eventually came back to exact her revenge. This is one part that is haunted, but we're going to be heading up to Smithfield's Market, folks. And as we're heading up here, you will see Cowcross Street. And as you'll know from other videos, that usually in the city of London, the names of the streets usually represent the economic activity or the activity at the time. So it is on this very street where the cows would cross the River Fleet, making their way, sometimes traveling very long journeys, up to be butchered and sold at Smithfield's Market. So let's make our way up. Let's go. To one of the most haunted spots in London. So you'll see the meat market very shortly, the largest and longest running wholesale meat market in the country Origi originally a cattle market i believe mm. but the area is close to saint bartholomew's hospital and the, the oldest beautiful the oldest still running hospital in the world nearly a thousand years old that's right it dates back to 1123 yeah. doesn't it and also <clears throat> the priory that was built in the same area saint bartholomew the great and there's two churches St. Bartholomew the Great and St. Bartholomew the Less. I love that. I love the way they used to use <laughs> Old English. St. Bartholomew the Less. So here's the wonderful Sir Horace Jones 19th century building. Same architect who built Tower Bridge. He actually built Tower Bridge, Leadenhall Market yeah. and Billingsgate. Billingsgate. Billingsgate Fish Market. So the actual architecture of this building is remarkable. And it's really not for the faint-hearted. If you do decide to head in there, you will be smelling. So it's definitely not for vegetarians or vegans. The smell of fresh meat is overpowering in here. But and that's not the only smells they have detected over the years. Over the years, the butchers have spoken about a lot of paranormal activity in this area. And they've spoken about the smell of burning flesh. I spoke about the screams of agony of poltergeists and paranormal activity in the area. And that is all due to the fact that it was a massive execution site straight ahead. And we're going to take you down some very cool, dark alleyways. And some of these places are not familiar to a lot of people in London. So I just want to keep you on the right direction so you'll know exactly where to go you decide to follow this tour yourself. Now, what we are doing today is we're kind of following the route of our ghost tour, which is conducted by our wonderful colleague and tour guide, Matt. Now, Matt will make an appearance in this video later on. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about primitive surgery in St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Quite horrific, some of the procedures. And very archaic, shall we say. So we're making our way up here to Charterhouse Square. And the building here is a stunning example of both Tudor Elizabethan and later architecture. And I want to show you what was. So it was a 14th century Carthusian priory founded by a chap called Walter de Manning. Now, there was a massive need for graveyards in London, even as far back as the 15th century. And Walter de Manning had actually bequeathed this area that you'll see on the right, this land here, to be used as a mass burial gravesite. But we'll come back to that in just a moment. But I wanted to show you this amazing priory that was built in the 14th century, in 1371. And it was a Carthusian priory. And even to this day, inside the building, you will see cells of monks that were confined into solitary confinement and also taken vows of silence. And I'm going to try and get inside 
and do a full tour on this priory. I'm in the process of speaking to them. But years later, when it was sold again, um, it became an almhouse or a school for disadvantaged boys in the area. Now technically it's used as a retirement home, but it's a stunning example of Tudor, Elizabethan and Victorian architecture. And if you look at the red brick there, from parts of the existing priory, you'll see the old Tudor bricks. And Walter de Manny, the founder, they unearthed his actual remains during a massive renovation of the area. There is a tomb and a plaque dedicated him right over there in the right hand side of this courtyard. But the white bricks you see on that building were, they were installed during a bombing campaign in World War II. The building was badly damaged, but they reinstated these, um, the Tudor brick is original. The white state brick was more recent times. So this beautiful place, so you can get guided tours here of the Charter House. And that's a plan of the original building as well, of the layout of the entire Charter House. But there's something else I want to talk to you about, because over here is another very interesting part of the building, albeit quite gruesome. The Priory was closed down in 1535 during the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII. Four men refused to leave the Priory. And that was the Prior, John Houghton, and three other monks, and they refused to accept Henry VIII as head of the church. The four men then were accused of high treason, and they were hung, drawn, and quartered. And parts of their body, John Houghton's body, his arm in particular, was actually... Nailed to the door. Was it? That's right. It was nailed to this, this door, this door. original gatehouse, to the charter house. It's such a gruesome past, and yet a stunning, stunning building to look at. Now, it's getting a little darker, so I'm going to try and film it in a, a better light. But first, Rob is going to tell us a little bit about another bit of history in the area. Well, this area of greenery just over here uh, looks quite nice, doesn't it? Looks like a nice little peaceful park here in uh, central London. But there's a reason it's green. There's a reason it hasn't been built on. And that's because it contains one of central London's largest plague pits. Now, this isn't the Great Plague of 1665. This is the Black Death. Now, the Black Death can trace its roots to Asia. It reached the shores of England in 1348, uh, Weymouth, to be precise. It reached London by 1349. Now, it kicked off properly in the summer of 1349. It kind of died out around the December time. But in that brief window, it killed an estimate between 40 and 60 percent of the entire population of the country. That's crazy. Now, the population back then was about six million, roughly. So they reckon about three and a half to four million people were killed by the Black Death in just that short couple of month uh, period. By the time it burnt itself out, Western Europe was decimated. Over 60% of all the people oh in Western Europe were God, killed. that's crazy. It reared its head again about 10, 12 years later, 1361, and then it killed another 20% of all the people here in the country. So not a lot of people survived the 12th century here in London. Well, the Black the Death is said to be the, the deadliest pandemic in all of history, yeah. wasn't it? So how many do they estimate are actually buried here, Rob? Uh, well, there's wild sort of um, variations. Some people say 2,000, other people say 20,000. So up to from two to 20,000. Yes. Um, but of course, there mm -hmm. were mass graves as well because oh, yeah, there was lack of... Yeah. Uh, well, there was no great well, the space. Cemeteries there are was full no up. room for the living, and there certainly was no room for the dead. And effectively, exactly. and they do occasionally find these uh, plague pits when they dig things like the London Underground, or the Crossrail, exactly, or the Elizabeth Line. Yeah, just right down the road here. there, we saw the Elizabeth Line station earlier. And there's on. another one coming up over here. So when they Liverpool were building Street, the Crossrail, Liverpool Street is another one of them underground where they found a plague pit, and under Green Park, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, one statistic I was reading as well is that because London was so overcrowded. Not only was there no room for the living, there was no room for the dead. So these church courtyards, they were um, just mass burials. They were on one plot of land at all. They were, they were putting up to 30 bodies in the same um, plot. So they were literally bursting at the seams. Mm. And even if there was flash storms or lashing rain, there's body parts 
just basically swimming down the streets yeah. of London. And that's when they introduced the magnificent seven cemeteries after the Cemetery Act and had to build those beautiful Victorian Valhallas. Which anyway, is... getting back to that. So because of the cholera epidemics and because of well dysentery and scurvy, um, there was one period where they could directly link the cholera to the water being contaminated by rotting flesh. So effectively, the dead were killing the living mm. in London. There was so a guy we... called John Snow. That's right. Who traced the cholera pandemic back to one single water pump, which was that's on right. uh, in Berwick Soho, Street. Derrick Street in Soho. In Soho, that's right. And um, the founding father of the science of epidemiology. Yeah. And that water pump still exists. It's now there. It's got a little plaque on it. I think I did that in a Soho tour somewhere along the line. Yeah, the old water pump in Soho. Look, Look at this, this curious yeah, this place. Yeah, this beautiful place. This must be a little witch's house. Oh, the door's open as well. This is quite simply <laughs> called the cottage. Look how gorgeous it is. So, uh, looks like it might be slightly out of place. Somebody yeah, seems to be yeah. just moving in there. Yeah. And I don't want to disturb them, but I just want to show you this. Right in the window, this permanent fixture. It's quite creepy. There's a little black cat in the window. So. This is quite simply called the cottage. Isn't it beautiful? It's quite creepy looking, mm. isn't it, Rob? There's a really beautiful like wooden door if you look inside. Is there? I can't like a really Tudor. sneaky. Look at that big wooden door at the back. Oh wow, I couldn't actually do it because I feel bad the guy's just <laughs> moving in there. But let's head up. We're gonna appear now to St. Bartholomew the Great. And as you'll see, the names of the pubs represent, of course, the meat market in the area. There's the Butcher's Hookers here, isn't there? There's the Old Red Cow. Line new, station. The new Farringdon yeah. Elizabeth Line station, folks. So this is where they would have done the digging over the last sort of five, six years. And that's right. That's where they would have unearthed all these plague victims from the Black Death. And so many other corpses. <clears throat> it's hard not to imagine how the tubes could be so haunted in London, disturbing so many people which they expected were going to be in restful slumber. Well, they were much more respectful in the Victorian times compared to today. So in the Victorian times, if they came across a burial ground on the tube, um, they tended to go around the edge, they'd take, make an effort of going around the edge of it. Whereas today, they just go straight through the middle of it. They, don't they do, anything. they don't even respect it anymore, right? They kind right? of uh, get all the bodies out they can, but... Um... Well, it was so interesting because the Victorians, <laughs> I mean, they took death very seriously. I mean, the more elaborate the funeral, they expected, expected the more welcome they would be yeah. at the gates of heaven and in paradise. And one particular thing I found quite disturbing, the reason people were so terrified of being dissected is that they genuinely believed that dissective corpses would not be accepted into, into paradise. Heaven, yeah. But uh, you had to be... So when the rapture happened... So when the rapture happened, exactly. All the, uh, the people, all the corpses and the bodies that were whole would rise and float up to the would heavens. Would rise and float to the heavens. But if you were dissected, you wouldn't rise to the heavens. So basically when you were dissected and hung, drawn and quartered, for example, they were killing you in life, but also killing you, killing you in, death, in the afterlife. In the afterlife, that's so and true. preventing you from uh, your eternal... Here's Cloth Court, by the way, and there was a fair here in London as well, a cloth fair. I mean, look how amazing it is down here. There was a cloth fair here in London that happened once a year and it took about, it was about two weeks and people made a lot of money on wool and cloth. That's how they applied their trade and the mayor would arrive and he would cut a piece of cloth to officially open the fair and this is where we believe the cut and the ribbon ceremony oh. originated from. But the poet laureate and famous writer down here, actually he's written some amazing books on London, particularly a guide to London's churches, John, so John Betchleman lived here and this is where he lived at number i believe it's 13 or 43 or oh, 43, 43 my apologies it's the home of john betch there's his blue plaque white right, folks so this is the church courtyard of saint bartholomew the great now i have a little video that i filmed earlier on and we will show you it very shortly but dedicated to saint bartholomew who was martyred in armenia when he was skinned alive and you will see a lot of effigies to St. Bartholomew involved in holding. I bet he uttered a few effigies as they were taking the skin off. <laughs> so rude, poor <laughs> St. Bartholomew. Um, a lot of them will have pictures of him holding his own skin. Now this is the courtyard and this would have been the graveyard 
of St. Bartholomew the Great. I'm going to take you inside now. I did that during the daytime because it's hard to film at night time around here. But right. So as we enter into the church of St. Bartholomew the Great, ladies and gentlemen, reputedly the oldest church in the entire city. Stunning architecture and one of the oldest surviving examples of Norman architecture in the country. It's dedicated to St. Bartholomew, one of the 12 apostles. I believe he appears in the scripture as Philip, and that's disputed, but St. Bartholomew saw a very brutal fate as well. He was martyred in the country of Armenia, but he died being skinned alive at the request of the brother of the king of Armenia. Ironically, he had managed to convert the king of Armenia, but his brother was afraid of the power that St. Bartholomew had over his brother. Refusing to relinquish his faith, he suffered the horrendous death of being skinned alive. And we'll see an amazing statue by Damien Hurst inside here of St. Bartholomew in just a moment. And just as before we head in, I'll just show you two distinguishing features there. There is a statue of Rahir, the monk who founded this church in 1123. Now Rahir is the ghost that is said to haunt this area, but Rahir himself was a, a monk, well he was originally a court jester to Henry I, and Rahir took a pilgrimage to Rome, and whilst there, he suffered from a very severe bout of malaria. On death's door, he prayed to God for help and he begged him to spare his life. And the story goes, he had a vision from St. Bartholomew. And Bartholomew agreed to spare his life, provided he converted his ways and became a holy man and built a church in the area, hence St. Bartholomew's, and this immediate church St. Bartholomew's the Great. Now the land was owned by Henry I, but uh, when he came back and he heard about this vision, Henry I immediately granted him permission to build this church. Now, it was extensively bombed, and this would have been originally the nave of the church, but let's have a quick look inside. Now right here, his tomb, during an extensive renovation in the 19th century of this church, his tomb was uncovered, and builders or construction workers actually opened up his tomb and while he was in peaceful slumber one of the men was very curious about his footwear and amongst footwear he stole one of his shoes complete with some of the bones of Rahir and it is said ever since that he haunts this church and what would have been the graveyard while the church is open so let's have a little look inside now again, I'll have to be quite quiet. This church has been used in several movies, like Shakespeare in Love, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, that other one with Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh, look at this, it's London's oldest parish church. Built when Henry the first son of William the Conqueror's King of England, that survived the Great Fire. 1666. Let's have another little look around. Some of the oldest part of the church is right in here. It's the cloisters. And this is Damien Hurst's stunning statue of St. Bartholomew holding his skin. is the Lady Lady Chapel and this is reputedly a printing works and in this printing works is where we believe Benjamin Franklin 
came to learn how to print. I'm being respectful in the church, folks. I hope you can hear me. So this is the Lady Chapel. No wonder it was used for so many iconic movies. The other, and oh, this is the Lady Chapel. My apologies. Oh, wow, look at this. So for a period of time, it was used as a printing works where we believe Benjamin Franklin once worked in here organ of the church. Let's have a look at the tomb of right here. The site of the only visitation of the Virgin Mary in London. Wow. So where she was said to have appeared in this church. We'll head around to here. Place is stunning. Now there's the tomb of right here. If you can get around the front there to see it for you. was said to haunt this place frequently. His appearance is usually in July. Just to show you how stunningly beautiful it is, but how creepy it is at night time as well. And here's some of the tombs, or some of the, the plaques here, commemorating the people who had died. Now we're also in the vicinity of some very posh restaurants in this immediate area. And I often wonder if the people who are buried alongside them, or if these people know but inside behind those grills there is that restaurant if they're on the level of the graveyard of St. Bartholomew the Great's church haunted by the ghost of Rahir and no doubt the ghost of St. Bartholomew who met a very evil fate being skinned alive okay, but right now we're going to head through what was the original Tudor gate And this building, this spectacular building, what was actually covered up for centuries and was only revealed during the, after stone was damaged on the front of the building during the bombing campaign of World War II. Let's take you through this amazing gate. I'll read a little bit about the history here of this gatehouse 
was restored in 1932 to the use of the church in memory of the two brothers, Aston Webb, R.A., and Ed Albert, Alfred Webb, F.S.A., also of Frederick Dove, who worked together on the restoration of the fabric of the church for over 40 years. Have a look at this, Sinead. What are we looking at here, Rob? There's a plaque okay. on the wall. Okay. Commemorating the funeral of of a man called Sir William Wallace. <gasps> That's the one. AKA Braveheart, AKA Mel Gibson. <laughs> Not to be confused with Mel Gibson, even though some suggest he too should be hung, drawn, and quartered, but alas. Sorry, yeah. Mel, if you ever get to see this video. <laughs> he was Black executed memories. for his accent. Sorry for his acting. Sorry for his activism. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> on the 700th anniversary of his execution at Smithfield Ems on the 23rd of August, 1305. And that is going to introduce us to his plaque. But first, let me just show you this gatehouse. He was believed to be six foot seven, William Wallace. Six foot seven? Believed to be. That's taller than you. It is. It? I'm what only are you, six, six, six? Wow. But for a man of the early 14th century, on the that average, was exceptionally massive, tall. That's true. About, so almost godlike. He must have been revered yeah, yeah. because of that alone. A foot and a half taller than the average man. But can you believe that this is original to the 16th century, ladies and gentlemen? This incredible building. Now the actual archway is 13th century, but the building on top is the 16th century. And in the 1700s, I believe, some guy actually covered it up with stone. And then during bombing campaign in World War II. Um, the stone was damaged, so they removed the stone, and this was an earth, this stunning building. Now, here we are back, Smithfield's Market. So, we're going to take you over here to the commemorative plaque that commemorates the Scottish rebel, William Wallace. Now, William Wallace was executed here in Smithfield's Market on the 23rd of August, 1305. Uh, executed for the highest form of treason in the land. William Wallace was hung, drawn, and quartered. Now, to be hung, drawn, and quartered was exceptionally barbaric, folks. He was stripped naked at the Tower of London. Both his feet were bound to a horse and cart. His naked body was dragged here, the one-mile journey, right to the centre of Smithfields. Now, St. Bartholomew's Hospital is in this area. We're going to talk about that in a moment. We've just spoke about St. Bartholomew's Church. Every year there was a fair day here called St. Bartholomew's Fair Day and 60,000 people from all over the country would arrive. And that fair day that year was the 23rd of August, 1305, because Edward Longshanks wanted to make sure that there was maximum exposure of the execution of William Wallace. So when he arrived here, his body was torn to pieces after being dragged a mile. He was hung within an inch of his life and then revived. And they emasculated him, they cut off his penis and his testicles. Some would suggest they even put his genitalia and stuffed it in his mouth. After that, they slowly carved a hole in his stomach and disemboweled him and removed his intestines. Then they cut off both his arms, both his legs and his head. His arms and legs were sent to four different parts of the United Kingdom. One to Newcastle, three to the other parts of Scotland. And then his head was dipped in tar and placed on a spike in London Bridge. A brutal, brutal form of execution, reserved again for the highest form of treason. Others to have received that punishment were the likes of Watt Tyler and, of course, the Abbot Houghton. Guy Fawkes as well. St. Bartholomew the Great. Guy Fawkes of the Gunpowder Plus assassination <clears throat> attempt. The idea behind the quartering was they buried them in four different unmarked burial graves, burial grounds. So the supporters of William Wallace didn't have a place to go. Oh, to, to, pay, to their pay their respects. Oh, wow. So they deliberately buried him in four different graves. They wouldn't say where the graves were. Um, so if you were a supporter of William Wallace, you didn't have a place to go to and gather. To actually commemorate him. And commemorate him. And also, That's you interesting. yeah, you wouldn't have a place to kind of launch a campaign from, if you will. Butchers Hook and Cleaver, folks. Yeah, and I mean, well, most people come here now and they pay their respects here. Yeah. Particularly on the anniversary of William Wallace. You get a lot of Scottish patriots. They're just about to close the gates here, ladies and gentlemen. But this Ooh. was the site. Oh, just missed it, but that's okay. Of execution. Bloody, Bloody Mary. Mary. AKA Mary the First, AKA Mary Tudor. So Mary was, of course, the daughter of King Henry VIII, one of his uh, three children along with Elizabeth I and Edward VI. 
Can we just get a quick panoramic? Can we have a sneak in? Can we have a quick panoramic in here? Yeah, yeah no worries, I'll be mate, two no minutes. Worries. That's all, darling. Just wanted to bring and you. Go ahead. Course, sorry. Well, this sorry, was, of course, a very confusing time in history because obviously Henry VIII uh, disbanded the church, Catholic Church, founded the Church of England. But then his daughter, Mary, very much quite the opposite in way of thinking. She was very much staunch Catholic. Catholic queen. So all the people who'd um, followed her father and um, supporting the Church of England, when she became queen, she very swiftly tried to reverse their uh, their thinking. And those who didn't repent and didn't go back to the Catholic way of thinking were sadly put to rather grisly death. That grisly death involved burning, burning alive right here at the stake. And she was so brutal, she insisted redwood wasn't used, folks, because there was a danger you would asph asphyxiate on the smoke before you felt the flames tearing at their flesh. The brutal bloody, bloody Mary. But what's interesting to me is everybody calls her Bloody Mary. But I mean, she's responsible for murdering 287 Marian martyrs, they're called now, in this area by burning them alive at the stake. But her father murdered 70,000 people. <laughs> this is the, the bizarre thing, the Catholic Mary. And yet her yeah. father is given a full royal burial and is now buried in St. George's Chapel the in Windsor. Patriarchy, Sinead. Now, patriarchy, I guess, yeah. But now, coming up here is St. Bartholomew's Hospital, folks, now the primary centre of care and cancer, coronary care and cancer care here in London. But again, as Rob said earlier, the oldest hospital. And it's through here that we have another couple of ghost stories to tell you. Oh, yes. About the area. And Rob is going to tell us a little bit more about that. But before we do, we're going to head through I'll just show you the courtyard back here. Let's head in this direction and get a view of St. Bartholomew the Less, which was the priory on the church grounds as well. Again, this built, stunning building built by Rahir as a result of a vision from St. Bartholomew. And I just want to get a perfect view of the, this gorgeous church for you. St. Bartholomew the Less. And this is going to take us right into the back of the courtyard of St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Let's have a quick look through here. But here they do a lot of filming in the laboratories up here. And Rob is going to tell us a little bit about the ghosts in this area. Well, there's a couple in uh, St. Bart's Hospital. Is there? Um, first of all, there's a ghost known as the Grey Nurse, and she's believed to be the ghost of a nurse back in the 19th century who accidentally administered a fatal overdose to one of her patients. Um, she was so gutted and, and unbelievably overwhelmed at sadness at her Grief. mistake that she took her own life. Now, they do say that nurses who work here today, if they're ever on the verge of committing the same mistake themselves, they feel a phantom touch Presence. of a hand on their shoulder, the grey nurse warning them not to do it. There's also a very old elevator lift in, uh, in St. Bart's Hospital, known by the staff as the coffin lift. It dates back to around the early 1900s. Um, a nurse was believed to have been murdered in the lift by a deranged patient in the, on the basement level. And these days the lift um, experiences strange phenomena like the lights flickering on and off. Um, some staff say they get into the lift and they press what floor they want to go to instead of taking them up. It takes them it right takes back them down, down again. Down oh, into yep. the basement level. Basement when it reaches level. the basement level, which is where the nurse is believed to have been murdered, the doors open, the lights go out. No matter how many times they've mashed those buttons, they cannot get the lift to move. So they get out the lift, they walk through the basement, up the stairs, back to the ground floor, and guess what's waiting for them there? The lift, the no lift. way. Doors it's open. It's a mind of its own. Lights on. Some people even claim they've walked up the stairwell next to the lift and they can hear the lift following them up. And when they get to the floor, they look and the lift is waiting for them. They're oh my God, to, that's uh, creepy. Oh, wow. There's also a rather more tragic ghost of a, a small boy. Um, believed to be aged between six and eight years old, who's often seen running through the wards and shouting for his mum and his dad. Uh, believed to be the tragic spirit of a young boy who sadly passed away in one of the wards here at St. Bart's. Oh, and he's who still... Is, uh, who now haunts the building. Oh my God, look at this incredible area. Well, this is also the centre of where some very brutal surgical procedures took place 
in 17 and 1800s. And to tell us a little bit more about some of those procedures is my wonderful colleague, Matt. Over to you, Matt. So the medicine only started changing in 17th century. Before, for ages, it was all the same. When the doctor saw the patient, didn't really touch the patient, but ask for the date, when the person was born and when the problem started. So he could make two horoscopes on these two dates. Uh -huh. And comparing the horoscopes would give him the answer, what are the chances for this person on this day to survive? They so believe basically medicine was based on astrology, yes. is that what you're saying? Because if you look at the sky, we see millions of stars and five planets. The planets look the same, just a little shining object, but the stars are always in the same position, planets are moving around. Okay. Today we know that they go with the Earth around the Sun. They didn't know this in the Middle Ages. So different position of the planets, they believed it's God putting them there to send them messages. That's why astrology was a religious thing as well, because they believed it's deciphering God's will through the position of stars and planets. Wow. So if the person died, the doctor could say, well, it was written in stars, there's really nothing I could do, that's the God's will. Oh so that's God. why the doctors did it to kind of as an insurance. If the patient died, it was not their fault, it was the God's will written in stars. Wow. And in most cases, really, they couldn't help much. One of the most common procedures was letting the blood. It was supposed to level the balance of fluid in the body just by cutting a vein and letting some blood out. Oh my God. It was a dirty job, so of course, doctors didn't want to do it. It was done by the barbers. That's right, With the right. very same razors, they shaved the beard, they would cut the vein. And when they started doing this and advertised, barbers started putting a bowl of fresh human blood in window. As you can imagine, it didn't stay fresh for long. So to make it nicer, they would put outside the window a white piece of cloth with blood stains on it. And this cloth with blood waving in the wind gave us this red and white barber's oh, pole. Oh, that's right. That's, that's all right. the barbers have it today, but none of them is doing bloodletting anymore. Thank God. Thank yeah. God. <laughs> they still did it in 19th century. In 19th century, they did it to cure hysteria attacks in women, which was not a real disease, but it was a real problem caused by very innocent invention. A little metal ring. If you have in your shoes, when you put the laces through the metal ring, this metal ring was deadly when it was put in the corset. Because this allowed to squeeze women in the corset into this hourglass-shaped Shape. figure. Oh. The corset is called the only garment that could kill. Because women were so squashed, they, everything in the bellies was squashed and the ribs pushed into the lungs. So the woman, of course, squashed like this, couldn't breathe, and she was g gasping for air. And they said, oh, she's being hysterical. Oh my and it's always women behaving like this. And that's why it's called hysteria, because it's from hysteros, which means womb in Greek. Oh my God. So what to do to calm down this hysterical attack? Cut her vein and let the blood out. And she did calm down, but only because she lost a lot of blood. And that's why they wrongly thought it's helping. This wow. problem with hysterical attacks stops when the fashion change and women started wearing loose clothes and then they realized that suddenly women don't have hysterical attacks because they can breathe. Oh my God, all in the name of fashion. <laughs> yes, exactly. Wow. Now, also, for example, in 16th century, there was a theory that the cure should look like the body part that's supposed to help. That was for headache, they would give people a walnut. Because when you open the walnut, it looks like a brain inside the head. That's crazy. For teeth ache, it was white flowers that looked like hanging teeth. Oh my God. For, for example, toothache. For toothache, for yes. Toothache, yes. Something okay. that looks like a healthy tooth. Oh my God. For example, Queen Elizabeth I, she always has this portrait with white face. Yes. Which was supposed to mean that she's like beyond age, she's not aging. Okay. If you notice, she never smiles. If she would have smiled, you would see she had completely rotten teeth. Rotten teeth. Rotten teeth. She oh. wasn't, but she wasn't embarrassed. She was very proud of it because everybody envied the rotten teeth of the queen because people knew the teeth get like this from eating too much sugar, which was one sugar of the most... Sugar was a sign of wealth. Exactly. Yes, it was one of the most expensive things. So apparently poor people would paint teeth with charcoal to make it look rotten from the distance. But again, the That's fashion changed. Yeah. You can never now think what, what was attractive. Yeah. Yes, of course. But then the, the fashion changed because when the queen had white face, she wanted the teeth to be white again. And the doctor had a solution, which was rubbing white sugar into the teeth. Because he hoped that the white from the sugar will come off on the teeth. 
but of course it only made things worse. Yeah. Yes, yeah. of course. Wow. Also, another thing for the for the headache, if the walnuts didn't help, you have to buy a piece of skull, a piece of human skull, which doctored ground to the powder, mixed with wine, and people would drink it. If somebody had anemia, like they call it weak blood disease, these people waited next to execution places. When somebody young and healthy was executed, the head came off, they put the cup quickly to catch the blood, to drink it, to improve their own blood. Well, okay, technically that kind of would have worked. Exactly. Be before they knew how the blood system works, they believe it just kind of fills the blood with something better. So basically, that's vampire behavior. Exactly. But this is not as medieval as it may think. The last time that we know of somebody drank human blood for medicinal purposes was in 1908. So people really for a very long time believed that somebody's healthiest person's blood will improve your own. That is absolutely fascinating. It's terrifying. It's terrifying, but it's, uh, and it's kind of, but this, as I always say, all these mistakes led to what we have today, the current medicine we have, because they have to try everything else. Well, of course, so. trial and error. Yes, of yeah. course, you have to get it right. But I mean, like even in the, the, the surgery at the time, if you had a compound fracture or a broken leg, they just cut your leg off. It, well, this, it was in, in the U University College London, who had a very thriving medical department, there was a simple leg amputation. Leg amputation was quite common and the surgeon had to cut the muscle with the knife and then sew the bone with the saw. It was in under two minutes. Cut the mus muscle with the knife and then sew through the bone, bone yes. with the saw. Yeah, it and it was done in under two minutes and quickly tied up to keep the blood. So it was sometimes successful, but this time it went wrong. It was in the operating theater, many people watching it, and the assistant was holding the leg. When the surgeon cut the muscle, his knife slipped and got out of assistant's fingers. So when it happened, the patient bled to death. The assistant died from the infection of dirty knife. That's right, because there was no Listerine. And invented. someone who was yeah. watching this died of heart attack. Oh my God. So, so three, three people deaths. died during the unsuccessful leg amputation. Wow. Now, ladies and gents, aren't we um, very grateful for modern day science? But uh, nowadays, that's not the case here in St. Bartholomew's. It's one of the best hospitals and most respected hospitals in London. Important to know. So our next stop is there's massive history along here, folks. And getting back to anatomical research at the time, um, we're going back again to the graveyards. And that there was a period of time where there was a massive shortage of bodies for surgeons to dissect for anatomical research. So a whole new industry was born and it was called the resurrectionists or the grave robbers. And literally the graves were being robbed of the corpses, freshly dug corpses who had just been buried. And they would head into the graveyards, these gangs of resurrectionists. They would cut holes in the top of the coffin. They would attach a noose around the corpse, corpse's neck and literally lift the corpse through the earth and they would bring them right across the road here it's a very famous pub called the fortune of war very dark history because it was known for displaying these stolen corpses inside in the pub and they would attach the name of the body snatcher to the corpses in this pub in the fortune of war and the surgeons would casually walk across from saint bartholomew's hospital and effectively shop for the corpses. There was even talk about how surgeons would haggle over the price of a corpse right at the foot of these corpses before. And this pub was located here on Cock Lane, but it was formerly known as Pie Corner. And you'll see this little gold the baby fat here. Baby. The fat baby of Pie Corner. And there's a little bit of history about it here. Where is that? Just on the There's corner. There's a plaque here, just that tells us a little bit about it. This explains it to you. The boy at Pike Corner was erected to commemorate the staying of the Great Fire. So this is effectively where the Great Fire ended. Mm. Many people and at the time believed the Great Fire of London was a punishment from God. For gluttony, for wasn't gluttony. it? That's right. And, and the reason right. they came to that conclusion was the fire began on Pudding Lane and ended, and ended at Pie Corner. And pudding pie, corner. pie. Pudding pie. Fat naked baby. Fat naked baby. It all makes sense. You mentioned the boy was made.
prodigiously fat to enforce the morale. He was originally built into the front of a public house called the Fortune of War, which used to occupy this site and was pulled down in 1910. What they used to do, because you've got St. Bart's Hospital just over the road, and the, and the, the used doctors to... and the surgeons would pay, on average, about five pounds for every fresh body that they were delivered. It was massive Anna. money at the time. Massive money, and then where better to go and spend your five pounds that you've just earned over there than in the pub over the, the road? The fortune of war. So and the... not only that, they used to pull their teeth as well because yeah. teeth um, were used um, as false teeth. Essentially, yeah, yeah, that they could make thousands of pounds in other money, <laughs> and then people used to pay the grave diggers more money to actually bury the bodies or the corpses further down. Yeah. So you'll see these posters of safety for the dead is the poster over a coffin. And that basically will give you a price list, six feet, seven shillings, eight feet, nine shillings, 10 feet. So the further down your body was dug, the less likely you would be robbed by the grave snatchers. But 1832, the Anatomy Act came in and that was as a result of a story involving Burke and Hare. Uh, two Scottish grave diggers. Well, they were actually Irish, would you believe? Oh, really? They were originally was... from Ireland, and they were caught in Edinburgh because, I mean, obviously they saw that how profitable it was to sell bodies, so they ended up murdering people. Mm. I think it was 16 people they murdered, but they were very clever in who they murdered. Burke and Hare only attacked people that wouldn't be missed in society, like the elderly or the mm. disadvantaged or unwed mothers who had been cast out of society. Eventually they were caught up with, Burke was executed. I believe Hare got away with it because he sold out Burke. And the Anatomy Act came in where they made it legal for people in workhouses who hadn't been claimed by relatives to be used for dissection, which was exceptionally cruel, considering that people believed that if your body was dissected, you would never, as you said earlier on, have a passage into heaven. Mm. But the reason we keep walking down here, this is also Cock Lane, because Rob is going to well, tell us the most incredible story about... So, and there's over an amazing to you, Rob. story based on this very road here. It took place in 1762. Now, it involves three people, a man called William Kent, a man called Richard Parsons, and a girl called Elizabeth Parsons, who was the daughter of Richard. Now, Richard and Elizabeth, they owned a house here on Cock Lane. Uh, William Kent was a bit of a shady what you'd probably call a loan shark or, um, um, yeah, a, a bailiff, a loan shark. He lent money pe to people and expected it to be paid back. Now, he rented, along with his wife, Elizabeth Lines, he rented Richard Parsons' house. Now, Elizabeth Lines sadly passed away whilst in the house. And um, after she passed away, there was spiritual activity. But this all seemed to end as soon as, as William Kent left. Now, William Kent then shacked up with Elizabeth Lyons' younger sister, Fanny. That's Fanny right, Lines. Fanny Lyons. Now, <clears throat> Richard Parsons found out that Fanny Lyons also died. She died of smallpox. Now, William Kent had lent Richard Parsons some money. Now, Richard Parsons didn't pay it back, so William Kent took him to court, and the favour got a judgment in his favour, so Richard Parsons ended up having to pay back the money to William Kent. Now, he wasn't happy about this. A few days or months after this, Richard Parsons claimed that there was a ghost in the house. Now, this ghost allegedly was uh, Fanny Lyons, the younger sister of Elizabeth Lyons. Now, the way she'd uh, contact the, uh, the residents of the house, Richard and his daughter Elizabeth, is she'd make scratching noises. Now, the scratching noises would come from underneath the bed of Richard Parsons' daughter. Now, this story broke in the newspapers. Everyone was absolutely fascinated by it. It was actually reported under the amazing headline, I promise you this is true, Scratching Fanny, the ghost of Cock Lane. Oh what, a, what a headline, eh? How gross. Um, leading figures at the time, including a man called Dr. Samuel Johnson, famous for writing the dictionary, uh, they were obsessed. They were obsessed with this story. Um, Richard Parsons kept holding seances in his house with his daughter. Uh, Samuel Johnson would attend with other leading figures of the day. Cock Lane would regularly be thronged with people wanting to uh, hear the sounds of the scratching from under the bed. And from the seances, they deduced, the ghost told them that she'd been murdered by her husband, William Kent. William Kent had actually poisoned Fanny Lyons and killed her. Now, because of this, William Kent was actually arrested and they investigated the murder. 
And it's the only time in British legal history that a murder trial has gone ahead based on the evidence of, of a, ghost. a ghost. Wow. Now, eventually they uh, looked into the crime. They looked into the case led by Samuel Johnson, and they concluded that it was actually the daughter of Richard Parsons who was creating the scratching noises by dragging chains underneath her oh bed. My it was God. all a massive hoax. And the idea behind it was Richard Parsons was trying to get William Kent either put in prison or executed, and it was all over that financial debt that he had owed him that he'd ha he'd owed him and he'd taken him to court and dragged his name through the mud in the end william kent was acquitted they found out there was no case to be answered for as for richard parsons and his daughter they were pilloried which meant they were put in these stocks and rotten fruit and vegetables were thrown at them and then they did two years inside prison themselves so he tried to get william kent thrown inside he ended up going ended inside up himself going. well they got lucky to get off for just two years they did. didn't they but the scratching fanny of Cock Lane ghost story lives on. Like well, speaking of seances, they regularly host them here in the pub we're approaching now, folks, in the Viaduct Tavern, said to be the most haunted pub in Britain. But right here, St. Sepulchre without Newgate. This stunning church has massive history with regards to execution. Inside there, there is an execution bell. The execution bell, ladies and gents, that's on display here in the nave in a glass case was rung by the clerk outside a condemned prisoner's cell the night before his execution. And those prison cells were located right here in what was known as Newgate Prison. Now, the highest criminal court in the land, the incredible Old Bailey. And that's coming up here on the left-hand side. Newgate Prison was where the last public execution took place in London, right across the street by this fountain here in this amazing building, which was formerly Newgate Prison, now the Old Bailey. Those condemned prisoners that were facing execution the following morning would hear the execution bell and this morbid toll. All you that in the condemned hold do lie, prepare you for tomorrow you shall die. Watch all and pray the hour is drawing near that you before Almighty God will appear. Examine well yourselves in time repent that you not to eternal flames be sent. And when St. Sepulchre's bell tomorrow tolls, the Lord above have mercy on your souls. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most haunted pubs in London is coming up. I have done a video on this, folks. This is the Viaduct Tavern. And with its proximity to the Old Bailey and its mysterious prison cells, you cannot afford to miss our video on the Viaduct Tavern. That, ladies and gentlemen, We'll conclude tonight's ghost tour. Thanks again, you guys. Sinead here with Free Tours by Foot London. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Myself and Rob will be leaving links to our Buy Me A Coffees and PayPal's at the bottom. If you'd like to buy us a drink in the Viaduct Tavern, you're more than welcome to do so. Happy Halloween. Stay tuned bye -bye. for some very spooky content. Night.